Have you ever wondered how I got started in children's ministry? Well, I'm gonna tell you today, but I'm not gonna do my typical monologue that you're used to. We're gonna do something different. I was interviewed by Pastor Glenn Blakeney from uh, Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, just a couple weeks ago. And uh, he interviewed me, asked me all kinds of questions about children's ministry and what I do and how I got started in this ministry and all. And so he gave me permission to uh, play that video for you today because many of the questions that he asked me, you have asked me as well. So I thought this would just be a great opportunity to hear this interview. So sit back, get a cup of coffee, enjoy yourself. Be sure to click the like button if you're watching by video. And uh, whether you're watching by video or on uh, audio, would you please subscribe to my channel? So the next time that I upload a video like this, you'll be sure uh, to get the notification, okay? So let's get started now with Pastor Blakeney and how I got started in in this kind of supernatural children's ministry. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the broadcast today. Glenn Blakeney here of Awake Nations Ministries and also um, the senior pastor of Harvest City Church in Vancouver, Canada. My wife and I are privileged to serve there. How are you guys doing today? I pray wherever you are in the world, whatever time it is for you, that you are ready to hear the word of God. And I know you're going to be challenged. I know you're going to be greatly encouraged today as we look at the biblical topic of children experiencing God and the Holy Spirit in particular. My guest is Becky Fisher of Kids and Ministries International, and I'm going to be bringing her, her on in just a moment. She's going to be sharing her experiences and her knowledge of God's word related to seeing children encounter the Holy Spirit. You know, me personally, I am a guy that I just love to be able to see and establish everything scripturally. There has to be a scriptural foundation. So what does the Bible actually say about children experiencing the Holy Spirit? You know, someone has said there's no junior Holy Spirit. Well, that's true. But ultimately, in God, there's really no age in that sense either, right? So the scripture even talks about that. But here's some scriptures that uh, we need to uh, use or we need to look at in order to establish the precedent and the biblical reality that kids can encounter the Holy Spirit. First of all, in Acts 2, verse 17, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. All people, right? Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. So basically all nations, all generations, and that includes children as well. Jesus was in the temple. He went in to purge the temple at the end of his ministry. And of course, what ends up happening is people start coming in after he had cleansed the temple and it says he began to heal them. And he began to perform miracles. The blind began to see. And it says that the leading priests and the teachers of religious law saw these wonderful miracles. And they heard even the children in the temple shouting. Children were in church shouting. Ready? Praise God for the son of David. But the leaders were indignant. The people <laughs> didn't like it. The religious leader were not happy that these children were um, worshiping Christ. So guys, uh, nothing has changed today. There are people, of course, that do not believe that children can experience the Holy Spirit or they should experience the Holy Spirit. There's people that don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They don't believe in miracles and signs and wonders, and they don't, they don't really see the scriptural precedent or they refuse to see the scriptural precedent for prophesying. But the Bible is very clear that this is a reality, that in the last days, God wants to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. You know, um, Lynn and I, we've had the privilege to do a lot of ministry in other nations, and we've seen God move and touch children powerfully. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you guys um, some some footage here in a moment, as well as, as a photo. This is actually in the Philippines where we were present one night. Um, we had decided we're going to do an outreach. And so we, we said, we're going to invite all people from the surrounding villages to come and uh, we'll feed them. Just come and join us. We'll have, we'll have some music. And of course we'll preach the gospel. And so that night 
we began to do that. And at the end, after I preached the word of God, we started praying for people and little children were so drawn to the presence of the Lord. They came forward and they just asked me to pray for them. So here in the photo, I'm just laying hands on these children. They're being touched with the Holy Spirit. They're being healed. They're crying. They're weeping. Um, some of them are prophesying, being baptized in the Holy Spirit. It was just an amazing encounter that we experienced at that time. And so um, I'm going to bring Becky on. And, and I just know that Becky has seen the Holy Spirit move among children like this as well. So, Becky, thank you for joining us. Oh, it's so good to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, I'm really, really stoked about having you on. I, I just you. love uh, seeing God touch little children. Yeah. It's yeah. so beautiful. So yeah. tell us a little bit about your um background in terms of how you came to know the Lord and how you have gotten your journey, in other words, to where you are now and how you're ministering and, and impacting children and parents all over the world. Yeah, well, I'll try to give you the Reader's Digest version and make it as short as possible. But um, I was uh, born into uh, the home of a pastor, a Pentecostal pastor. My grandparents on my mother's side were uh, in the same denomination and were pastors in local churches. And my dad had four brothers and they were also uh, pastors in the same denomination. We were all in the Pentecostal genre. And so I was, um, you know, I, I was just born and raised into it. It was, it was in my DNA. And um, my mother tells me that at the age of five, that um, my dad was preaching and he gave an altar for salvation and I went forward and accepted the Lord that night. I have to honestly say I have no recollection of that whatsoever. All I can remember is that I just grew up loving Jesus. My testimony about the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the same. Um, I just was would uh, speak in tongues at, at the altar. And the tradition in our denomination was that we would go at the end of every service, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and it was our custom to go to the altar and kneel uh, at, at the front of the church and just spend some time praying. And I, I just always spoke in tongues. And so I, I don't have a recollection of any particular time. It was just there. And I find that there's a significant number of children raised in the church that have had the same experiences uh, that I did growing up, that they don't all... Uh, I have a date in their Bible that they wrote down on the day they got saved, if you know what I mean. And so um, that was my heritage. That was my background. I just grew up loving the Lord. I grew up involved in ministry with my parents. And so it was just a part of uh, my lifestyle and our, the culture of our family. Yeah. And so my entire life I served in the church, um, but never ever saw myself involved in children's ministry. Uh -huh. um, I took my turn, if you will, you know, all good Christians yeah. have to take their turn because yeah. when I was growing up, there really wasn't anyone. Um, we had Sunday school superintendents, but we didn't have yeah. children's pastors in those days. Yeah. And so we just looked to the volunteers in the church. And there were a couple of times that um, I was chosen to do the children's ministry for a year at a time. Um, I taught in Sunday school class. Uh, some of the older kids, um, I, we would call them preteens now. Right. And no matter what I did with the kids, we seemed to have a move of the Holy Spirit wow. uh, that lives were touched, kids were impacted, parents were surprised. And um, yet, even in those days, we saw healings, we saw kids feel the Holy Spirit. Wow. But even in that time, um, I didn't realize that I was called into children's ministry. Right. I uh, got involved in business. My dad resigned his church after 25 years, went into business. He recruited me to help as a manager of some of his businesses. And so I just sort of morphed along with my family and uh, just never really gave children's ministry a second thought yeah. until um, I uh, left. Uh, I was raised in Montana and, and as an adult, I um, migrated over to North Dakota and um, started attending a, a new church there. And um, we were seeing tremendous moves of the Holy Spirit. We were seeing people saved and filled and healings and the revelation. It was during the word of faith uh, season uh, back in Brother Hagin's day where the, the word of God was just, it was like there was a new revelation that we hadn't heard before. 
And so during that time, um, as churches have a tendency to do, I had been attending for about three years. That church had a split. They had no one to take over the children's ministry. And so literally our church went for two years without any ministry to kids. And I became righteously indignant. I did not recognize it as the leading of the Holy Spirit. Uh -huh. um, I just thought, well, if nobody's going to do this, I guess I'll do it. You know, and so I stepped in the role and the my attitude was going into it. Well, you know, I don't want to miss out on what God is doing in the adult services. And that's one of the things people will say. And when you try to recruit them for kids ministry, well, I would, but I just don't want to miss out on the move of God. Yeah. That should tell you something about the decrepit yeah. situations we have yeah. in our children's ministry. Nobody wants to go because there's no move of God. Okay. Right. That's another sermon. We'll do another yeah. interview on that one. But Sadly, the point, but sad, but true. Yes. Yeah. It's very true. Yeah. And, um, uh, and so I went in and I decided because I didn't want to miss out on what God was doing, that I was going to teach the kids what I was learning, what I was interested in, things like hearing God's voice, being led by the spirit, healing the sick, second coming of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, anything that I was interested in and that our pastor was uh, focusing on in any given season, I began to break down those sermons into small pieces and teach them to the kids in our church. Now, it took a period of time because I really didn't know what I was doing either. I had no mentor, no one to really uh, tell me this is the route you should go. So I was learning as I went, but I was there for eight years. And the further we got into it, the more of the move of the Holy Spirit, the more of the gifts of the Spirit, the more of the supernatural began to take place. And so this revelation came to me. Now, mind you, I was uh, running a business at the same time. I uh, had a sign company, and so that was my full-time job. I was just yeah. a volunteer at the church and uh, uh, never was taken on as uh, full-time. And, um, and, and so it was, it was my part-time thing. But God began to just reveal to me how hungry children are for a touch from the supernatural God and how they wanted to be a part of what God was doing. They didn't want to just sit and listen to us talk about it. And they were tired of the Bible stories. They wanted to get involved, just like all of the TV shows that you see, uh, like America's Got Talent, Canada's Got Talent, you know, and all these kids are coming in and showcasing their music abilities, singing, dancing, gymnastics, and all the rest. They don't want to just sit by and wait until they become adults. They want to get involved in it now. And so it was a revelation that was a gradual thing that came. And then just all of a sudden, I just burst out of the box. I just felt like I couldn't stay in a local church anymore. I felt like I had a message of the Holy Spirit that the rest of the world and other Pentecostal denominations needed to hear. And so that launched me. And there's more to that story, of course, but that's yeah. as much of a nutshell as I can cram that into, Glenn, yeah. as to yeah. how I got started in doing what I am now. And now we're in 29 countries. Okay. I have a school of supernatural children's ministry where I teach people everything that I've learned over the years about how to activate the kids and the things of the spirit. And we've just seen amazing things worldwide yeah. uh, through my own leaders, through people who have graduated through our schools, people who are using our curriculums and just contact us. Yeah. And so we know firsthand that God uses children. Kids are hungry for the supernatural touch from God. And um, so anyway, so you got to interrupt me here so you can no. jump in with a question or something here because I no. could just keep going. No, that's great, Becky. In fact, what you shared uh, is is exactly what I was hoping you would share. So that's perfect. But, you know, when we talk about children experiencing the Lord, a lot of, you know, there's this mindset in certain churches still out there and, and amongst a segment of Christianity that basically has this um, push for children learning stories of the Bible, Bible verses and that type of thing. And, and in a sense, doctrine even. And, and that's so okay. that's good. We, they need to know that. But, you know, in John 17, 3, Jesus said that this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. And the word know, of course, is literally means to know intimately, to know personally, to know experientially, not just theory, 
but practical, where the rubber meets the road, knowing God. And when you read the New Testament, the it talks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and in particular 1 Corinthians 12, and it talks about prophecy, tongues, interpretation, discerning of spirits, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, healing, uh, gifts of healings, you know, the working of miracles and so on. All of these things are available to whosoever is what the Bible yes. talks about because through the Holy Spirit, it's the manifestations of the Spirit. We're not seeking after the gifts per se, but when we, when we encounter the Holy Spirit, these things will emerge. Um, these gifts will emerge, these manifestations. And, and I just love the fact that you said that children, you saw children with such a hunger for God. They wanted to know God. They want the experience. They, they don't want to just be, you know, spectators and sit there. Unfortunately, when you go to certain churches and, and, places and you walk in and you see the kids and kids are maybe they're there for worship then they dismiss them to the class or whatever but you see them and they're just kind of like sitting there maybe they're coloring they're doing something but they're not worshiping they're not engaged there doesn't seem to be and it's almost like we as parents and even pastors um just we're kind of okay with that it's like well yeah when they get older they'll they'll get to know the lord and you know, they'll come in and make Jesus their own personal Lord and Savior, and they'll grow and they'll start to, you know, understand what it means to walk with the Lord and encounter him. But I just want to, I want to play a video. This is a video in the Philippines of young children encountering the Holy Spirit. And I want you guys uh, just to watch this. And then when we come back, it's just very brief. Becky is going to talk about some of the things that she's seen in terms of children encountering the Lord. Okay, let's watch this video. So Becky, why is it that kids and maybe in other countries um, encounter the Lord like that? They have such a passion to worship the Lord and, and it's not happening here. Now, I'm not saying it's not happening here at all. I get it. There's, there's ministries like yours and even local churches that children are really encountering the Lord. They're seeking after God. They have their own relationship. But what do you think it is? Like, why is it that they're with other countries in particular, there's just such a hunger among children. I, I don't know that it's necessarily countries or nations. I mean, we can all point to the, um, what we all think of as the American kids have so much so that they don't really need anything. And so other kids don't. And, you know, you have all of that. But the bottom line is you're not going to find that everywhere in the Philippines either. Um, we have videos. We have our own videos of kids like that. We have our, uh, well, I have a YouTube channel. Uh, that I um, make videos weekly for parents and for kids ministers. And in them, I pack them with videos from our ministry, with photographs from our ministry from all over the world. It's uh, We are in the Philippines, but we're in many other nations as well. And it really has to do not so much with the nation as it has to do with the leadership over those children. Somebody asked me about this the other day on Facebook, why is it that we always seem to find uh, that the nations are are so um, uh, more open to things? And um, uh, it, it it goes back to leadership. I had a bottom line because I can take you to some really 
dead children's ministries in the Philippines too. Yeah. It depends on what the leaders believe. It depends on what the leaders push for. It depends on what the leadership has been taught. There are places in Africa where we've seen ma major moves of God, but 90% of them honestly are just like American churches. So it all goes back to the leadership. It goes back to how those leaders were trained. It goes back to what they believe uh, children are capable of doing. And we have in most churches, and I'm including Pentecostal, charismatic, apostolic, prophetic churches in this, we have very little expectation of children when it comes to spiritual things. We know they can get saved, but beyond that, um, we really have no expectation. And I wrote a, uh, I, I have a, in, in the very first session of my School of Supernatural Children's Ministry, I really put out a challenge to the people who watch it because um, I follow very, very closely statistics from uh, LifeWay Answers in Genesis, George Barna, um, and all the rest of them, where they are actually doing scientific surveys, if you will, of the state of the church and uh, the state of children's ministries in the, the churches. And they will tell you um, that, for instance, George Barna came out with uh, uh, a number of years ago with the statistics that said that less than one in 10 Christian parents ever pray with their children in any given week. Wow. Less than one in 10 Christian parents ever read the Bible with their children in any given week. Less than one in 20 Christian parents ever have a worship time in their home with their kids. And that's just scratching the surface. The point is the parents are not alert. Pastors, I could I love pastors. My dad was a pastor. My grandpa was a pastor. My uncles are pastors, but I'm telling you that it comes from the head down and many pastors, and I won't put a statistic on it because I don't or a percentage because I don't have any facts to back it up, but a significant number of your children's uh, of your head pastors uh, view children's ministry simply as that thing to attract the adults to the church, which is the real prize. The real prize is the adults. And so you have to have a good children's ministry in order to get them there. And right. so you'll, you'll decorate your halls. You'll do all this stuff. You have all these fantastic activities. And I have had, I could name you famous pastors. Uh, there's this one guy, uh, who has just written a famous book on prayer that's all the rage right now. And he's being on all the talk shows talking about his book. And he was a pastor for 30 years. And he heard me teaching on this, that most pastors just see children's ministry as a, a, a means to an end. And he says, yeah. yep, that was me for 30 years of, of my pastoring. That was my attitude towards children's ministry. And so um, it's not just in the nations. It has everything to do with the attitude of parents, the attitude of a head pastors, the attitude of the fivefold ministry gifts. And I just thank God for every time I see a fivefold minister who's out there pulling on kids and like yourself going into nations. That wouldn't have happened if you wouldn't have pulled on them. Right. See, it had to do with your mentality. Right. You know, and so it, we fight against this constantly in children's ministry, um, especially if you're going to get into um, spirit filled, supernatural, that kind of thing. Then we are really in a world of our own. So, yeah, yeah absolutely. And, you know, um, look, when we go to other nations um, in particular, one of the things that we we saw, we, we realized in terms of need was, you know, there's there's poverty and there's uh, a need to help children. So we, we decide, okay, we're gonna do some things to help parents in terms of their children being able to have food, um, being able to get an education. So for example, um, okay, so in the Philippines where we, we've been involved extensively in certain parts where it's very poor, um, you know, the kids school, public school's free, but you need to have supplies. You need to be able to get to school. Sometimes these kids, they live out far away from the school. So we we got involved in helping them with with school supplies, that type of stuff, so they can go to school, bit of whatever. And so these kids, that helps, and we get their trust. But whenever we would go there, we would say, "Look, we are going to do an outreach into the community, but we're going to do an outreach." for adults, so it's kind of a more of a big general outreach where we 
we we give away things, we preach the gospel, we pray for people, but we've always done ministry to children. <clears throat> and when we do that, the kids come in, we, we, we pray with the kids, we have stories, we share the gospel with the kids, and we see the Holy Spirit move, baptize them with the Holy Spirit, see healing of, of little children and so on. And then we try to, even in the context of our churches, to get the parents and the pastors to begin looking at these kids as much of a disciple as the adults. And in yeah. fact, the focus has been primarily on training those kids at a young age because we yeah. need these guys to be able to be on fire for the Lord, to walk with the Lord, to, to lead their generation, whether it's in politics, government, you know, teachers or whatever it is, pastors. We need them to encounter God. So we've been very intentional about doing that. But I must say that in um, Western nations, sometimes it's kind of like you go on a mission trip and you see God move and then you come back to your church and you go, like, why aren't we reaching out in our own community? Why aren't we, we doing the same thing in our local church in our Western nations? And so I've, I've been challenged by that. But my concern is this is that, and I know you, you're you not only involved in, in um, training children or, or facilitating curriculum and, and opportunities for children to, to encounter the Lord, but you're involved in equipping parents and leaders. Yeah. And, and that's the key right there. And particularly parents, like right now, during the pandemic, we have kids at, at home, um, you know, Church is closed, so there's no no one ministering to the kids, right? Which is pretty right. sad when you think about it. It's scary. It is. And so because a lot of those churches don't plan on having kids ministry again until 2021. Right. Really? Yeah. <clears throat> really? Yeah. yeah. So we're just going to leave our kids to Netflix, YouTube, Disney, and um, Nickelodeon and just expect that they're going to turn out to be spiritual giants in another six months. Right. I don't understand the thinking of the church. Right. So how does the church, um, meaning church leadership, uh, collaborate with parents to um, really disciple kids to know God? That's a million dollar question. And if I knew the answer, I could be rich. Okay. okay. All right. Every children's yeah. pastor um, who is generally genu genuinely concerned about his kids is asking the same question. And it really appears that there is just a fraction. And again, I hesitate to put a number on it because I don't know that I would actually know, but I'm going to say it's surely under 25%. And that's being very generous of, of Christian parents who even have spiritual discipleship as a part of their thinking. Uh, you have homeschool parents uh, who probably would be in that category, but they are not necessarily um, uh, discipling their children. They'll have Bible classes in their homeschool curricula and all, and they may have a Bible lesson, but they are not actively discipling their kids any more uh, than the average Christian parent is either. Their, their mentality is more, we're just going to keep them away from evil, or if I have a handicapped child who needs extra care, uh, and extra attention, then this is what we're doing. And so I don't have actual facts, but it's a very, very small percentage of, of parents who actually do that. It does come down from the top. And I know one thing is to bring uh, awareness to it. The pastor needs to talk about it, but the pastors need a revelation too. The pastors are not getting this in their Bible schools, Glenn. You know that. Well, you went to a Bible school, seminary, whatever. They didn't give you a course on children's ministry and the importance of, of bringing kids in. It, it was only if the pastor had his own unique um, thing uh, to pursue his own interest or maybe the way he was raised or, or whatever, his own revelation. Um, and so then at that point, how do we do this? Uh, do we send Bible lessons home? Uh, with the parents, I mean, what do we do? Because every children's pastor wants to know the answer to this too. Right. Yeah, look, I mean, I think about discipleship. When you, when you look at discipling someone, which is, for me, is a huge part of, of my, uh, my focus, um, there's really no difference between a child and an adult in the sense right. that it's the same approach, right? Like 
So, so we have to be intentional about that. And, and I remember several years ago, I was uh, ministering somewhere and I felt as we were during worship, uh, I just felt like the Lord said, I want you to start to pray that the, that I would stir up the little, the children. And it was like, I think it was actually the story of, of Samson, even though the ending wasn't the best in Samson's case, where the, you know, it says that the spirit of the Lord began to stir him. And, and I, it was, I know it was the Holy Spirit spoke that to me. So I started to pray, Lord, stir up children, just stir up these children. And so I started to pray that. And then all of a sudden in our church, we started to see things happen with kids. Kids started weeping, crying, breaking down, um, you know, worshiping God in the service. And then we saw it in the youth and the youth were, were encountering God, the Holy Spirit. They're getting baptized the Holy Spirit. They're prophesying. They're being, you know, falling under the power of the Holy Spirit. Some of them had dreams. In fact, our son who now lives in Asia and he's uh, 23 years old, when he was 11 years old, when this was going on, he actually fell down under the power of the Holy Spirit and he saw Jesus and he described him to us at the time. You know, he said some things which were very, very biblical, um, but he couldn't have known that in the sense right. that it was pretty deep stuff. And, he's, and when right. he had the vision of Jesus and, you know, as we already read in Acts 2, that talks about children um, having encounters with God. Your children will prophesy in your sons and daughters. And so we know it's a reality scripturally, but we have to be intentional about facilitating that. But I really feel that culture is is critical in in our churches as a whole you know you you use the term supernatural we could call it spirit filled some people don't like that term supernatural uh because the devil's supernatural to his powers but we know you're referring to the holy spirit and so let's just share a little bit about your equipping that you do for parents and for leaders and what does that look like um, well, uh, one of the things that I have always done is train other people uh, to do what I do. Um, and it just sort of evolved that we started a school. I never started out intentionally deciding, oh, we should have a school. Um, it, it started as uh, conferences where I would teach different things and people were very hungry. And there were uh, I found out that there were, were a lot of people out there who were just as tired of traditional children's ministry as I was. And, and I could talk about this for a long time because we're just not seeing spiritual fruit. Right. Um, and I can just show you the facts right. um, on the whole thing. And so it just evolved over a period of time. And so now the school that we have is all um, uh, digital, if you will. Uh, yeah. You can take the classes online. You can take them as MP4s or buy DVDs and show them to your church teams or whatever. We, you can audit the courses, and all you have to do is buy the the school and uh, no further obligation. If you want to be certified, then we uh, do have people that have to take examinations with every single class. There's 45 classes, so it's very intensive. Wow. And the first uh, 17 classes are what we call children's ministry basics. So for just those people who are only interested in the children's ministry aspect, um, it, we teach them all the foundations. We teach them um, um and, and I can't get into all of it, but for instance, we'll teach them uh, how to uh, teach children to worship. We'll teach them how to bring children into the presence of God. Very few children's ministries ever have an altar call that goes beyond salvation. And so we uh, teach them, um, uh, uh, you know, all the different aspects of what they need to introduce. Uh, we have what we call a, a pattern of ministry, a tabernacle pattern of ministry, where we teach people who've only ever taught a Sunday school class how to put a whole uh, children's church service together. And wow. we use Moses's tabernacle in the Old Testament as our example. And we say, your children's ministry is like Moses's tabernacle. You start in the outer court, go to the 
inner court and then into the Holy of Holies. So the whole pattern of what you're doing in your service is you're gradually taking the children um, into the presence of God. And so there's a lot more to that, but those are the kinds of things we put a great emphasis. Our three core values are give kids the meat of the word. One of my big, big issues with the church is the only thing we ever seem to teach kids is the same 52 Bible stories over and over. And right. so we talk to them and I, I teach people, kids cannot live on Bible stories alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, we've got to give them spiritual meat. And I have whole sessions on that and our curriculum Okay. which is tied to um, uh, quickly the school also then has a second level more an advanced level where we go into much more depth about uh, teaching you the reasons for speaking in tongues, teaching you um, how to take kids into the glory of God, teaching you about the nine gifts of the spirit and what it looks like when a child operates in the nine gifts of the spirit. And then we share testimonies uh, from our, our ministry from that aspect. Um, and so uh, it, it's more the advanced supernatural levels. And I'm not a bit embarrassed to use the, the word supernatural because the devil stole that term from us. Right. Um, and so uh, ch churches shouldn't be so sensitive if you're running into that. Um, yeah. I have... I have some things I'm very dogmatic about, and that's one of them, because we serve a supernatural God. Actually, the word supernatural was never introduced un until um, uh, Bethel came out. Uh, Bethel uh, in, in California, they were the first one to really introduce the term supernatural. Up to that, it was divine encounters and a lot of different things, yeah. but right. I mean, that's another topic, I diverse. Um, so then our third level is for parents, parents who are really serious about raising kids to walk uh, in the fullness of the spirit, those uh, to be committed to God. It tells them what they can do. And we rely heavily upon statistics and facts and uh, other criteria where we can actually look at and say, OK, this is what has worked. This is what these parents did. And they were able to raise a spiritual champion. So do you want to do a spiritual champion? Then here's some guidelines for you. So we've got those three levels. And so I also have leaders in 14 different countries that they teach my school uh, in that. And so we're spreading the word to other children's ministries from there. And, um, and then uh, the curriculums uh, probably were the first thing that I began producing before the school. And the curriculums are absolutely critical um, because um, again, I, I, a lot of the curriculums, I actually were my lessons way back when, when I first started teaching kids ministry, because I couldn't find anything that went deep enough into the word of God for kids. And, um, you mentioned something that we give our kids Bible stories and doctrines. I will argue that point. We give them Bible stories, period. And then we might throw in the 10 commandments and we might throw in the armor of God and the fruits of the spirit and Noah's Ark along with that. But we do not teach them doctrine. And for the three generations running now, we have the, the, the lowest level of biblical literacy of any time in American history. I yeah. can't speak for the other nations, but I can speak for America. The, the biblical illiteracy of the kids being raised in our churches sure. is shocking. Right. Yeah, I'm very so, familiar with that. And, and you're yeah. right. It's true. And, and so our curriculums right. are critical. Yeah, absolutely. And and you're right. You know, I mean, doctrine in terms of understanding who God is, who the Holy Spirit is, what is salvation, et cetera, et cetera. There's not, you're right. There's not a lot of intentionality uh, in doing that and, and clearly um, systematically even going through that and helping kids to do that. But see, I feel personally like my, my story I was, um, when I was young, maybe eight, nine years old, my mom got saved and she encountered God in the charismatic renewal. And what ended up happening is she started taking me, uh, dragging me at, to church services. And during that time, there was a powerful move of God going on. So she took me to Catherine Kuhlman uh, three or four times. I was actually healed in a Catherine Kuhlman uh, service crusade as they call it during um, you know the 70s and as a kid and so I I experienced that I saw people healed baptized with the Holy Spirit I saw people's legs grow deaf ears opened as a kid and and again many different places that I went to so I always had that 
in me, like I encountered God. And, and in fact, when I was a child one day, I, was, I had such faith, you know, childlike faith that I had, um, I had growths, like basically warts on my hands as I was a kid. I don't know if it's because I didn't wash my hands enough or what, but what ended up happening is one day when I was going to sleep, I just looked down at my hands and I said, hey, Lord, I've seen you do all these miracles. Surely you can heal these warts and take them off my hands. And the next morning when I woke up, I got up, was going about my day. And I happened to look down on my hands and realize that every single one of them, there was like, there was quite a few of them. Every single one of them had disappeared. Wow. So as a kid, right? And so that really impacted me. And even though through my teenage years, I drifted away from the Lord and got involved in the world. I believe that had anchored me, those encounters and those experiences. And and it wasn't the theology, even though I did believe, I think I had a, a pretty good handle on, on the Bible as a kid, even because, you know, I at least the stories anyways. And and then, but it was this encounter with God or these encounters with God. And even later on in my, uh, as a young kind of 14, 15 year old, I had some powerful things happen to me. And that really tethered me, you know, to God so that when I'd run, but I couldn't get too far and eventually it brought me back. And I know it was the prayers of my mom. I saw supernatural things happen when I was um, in rebellion, like when my mom prayed and, and miracles happened and I was preserved and protected. So I really believe in that and kids encountering God. And just going back to what we were saying about the word supernatural, for those who do have a problem with that verbiage, Let's just break it down uh, in terms of the etymology. First of all, supra or supra means beyond, above the natural. God is clearly above the natural. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I say this, in fact, on my message this Sunday, I was preparing for that. And, and this is what um, I said. Second Peter 1 verse 4 says that we become partakers of the divine nature. God's nature is in us. First John 3, 9 says that his seed abides within us. Uh, I think one of the new living says his nature or something is in us. So God's nature, his seed is in us. And we're partakers of the divine nature. Therefore, we have a super nature, okay? Because God's nature is in us. And it's not unnatural. It's not natural. It's supernatural because we have God's nature in us, a super nature. Therefore, it's natural for us to live supernaturally. It is not natural for us to sin. It is not natural for us to, to live just in the flesh and to be carnal because now it is natural for us to be supernatural. And that's for kids as well. And, and I love that truth that this is what God has called us to is to walk in the supernatural, to walk in the spirit, to walk in in miracles and in, in the power of God, to hear God's voice, to be led by the Holy Spirit. Jesus was led by the spirit, even as a child, you know, and, and I really believe that that's so important. So let's just talk a little bit about children hearing the voice of God and 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 I know there's we have to be intentional and there's a skill set really that goes with equipping kids that way. But let's talk about that. Maybe if you have any stories or uh, as well, just just how do right. kids hear the voice of God? How do you help activate them in that? Well, again, we have our lessons, um, and I have one entire curriculum called um, "Hearing God's Voice for Kids." It's 13 lessons to teach them the basic principles that were given in the word of God, things like he has a still small voice and he leads besides still waters, uh, peace, we're led by peace, different things of that nature. And we just guide kids through and show them how God speaks and then um, give them opportunity to recognize, look back at things in their lives uh, uh, to, to say, oh yeah, oh, that happened to me. Okay. That was God's voice and different things like that. Again, this is something that really needs to take place in the home. I've had um, parents tell me that um, once their kid learns how to hear the voice of God, that 50% of their parenting is done because they police themselves. 
which I find very interesting. But as far as stories of hearing God's voice, we have a number of stories that, uh, and we're going to run out of time here. So I'm just going to have to give you the headlines. But we had a, a little six-year-old boy who was raised in our preschool curriculum. And in there is 13 little lessons to teach uh, three to five-year-olds how to hear God's voice. Wow. And uh, in the process of it, his aunt got deathly ill. And he heard God say, go pray for her and uh, that that he was going to heal her. Long story short, uh, they resisted. She didn't want company, but they he finally he wouldn't give up. So he finally went over, laid his hands on her and prayed for her because we also teach the preschoolers how to pray for the sick. Wow. And he laid uh, his hands on her, prayed a simple prayer. I have no idea what the prayer was, but she was healed instantly. Wow. We have a, another um uh, incidents where there was a gypsy boy in Europe um, who his mother, uh, I, I, I'm not sure if she had cancer or what the deal was, but she was gravely ill. And, um, and he heard God's voice say, get your father and have your father serve communion to the family and I will heal your mother. And so he did that. He told his dad what he heard God say. The dad did it. And um, and the mother was instantly healed. We had some other instances in um, there was an interesting um, uh, situation in Australia. There were some people that were start, had started one of our power clubs and there was a, a Muslim child that was attending one of the power clubs. And, um, and uh, I don't know if she at this point was born again. I don't know the whole story, but she went home. She was from a Muslim family and there was a slug of kids in the family. And this one day her dad um, couldn't find the remote control for the television. And uh, he became livid. He began screaming and yelling and, you know, the tension that can happen when a dad gets mad. And so she ran into her bedroom, knelt by her bed, <clears throat> excuse me, because she said, <clears throat> my teacher, my pastor has told me that God can speak to us. So, Lord, would you please tell me, show me where that um, uh, uh, remote control is? And he okay. did. He gave her a picture yeah. that had, had fallen down behind the couch yeah. in their living room. She got up from her knees, went in there and went straight to the remote control, got it and gave it to her dad. So now that is another way that God speaks. He speaks through pictures. That was like one of the number one ways he spoke to the prophets in the Old Testament. Um, and then probably our biggest story, if you will, and I'm, I'm leaving out a, a lot of, of details uh, just to give you the headlines. But we had uh, a, a boy in Mexico City, his dad had heard what we were doing with kids and he desperately wanted to raise his children to walk in the things of God like this. And so he got a hold of um, our curriculum, which was translated into Spanish called Hearing God's Voice. And he, for one year, he started a power club in his area. And a power club is the name that we use for a children's gathering in any country, any nation, in church, out of church, under a tree, in a village, wherever. It's just the name, you know, that we use. And so he started a power club in his home. His own two boys, uh, 10 and 11 at the time, or 9 and 11. And he began to teach them from the curriculum about hearing God's voice. Long story short, the oldest boy ended up in the hospital with an appendicitis attack. While he's in the hospital, there the news went through the hallway that a that a baby had been born, um, but they could not get any signs of life, and that the doctor had prayed for the or prayed. The doctor had uh, doctors had tried to do multiple um, things to bring that child to life. It was born prematurely, and they could get no signs of life after two years, wow. and so they finally declared. <laughs> I'm getting, I'm talking too much. I said two years, I meant two hours. Yeah, no and um, so okay. they finally had to declare the baby dead. Oh, wow. So as soon as that news came to Esteban, who's now a praise and worship leader in a large church in Mexico city. Awesome. Um, um, as soon as he heard that, he said, he told me this personally when he was 14 years old, I heard the voice of God say to me, go pray that that baby will be resurrected. And, um, and he said it was as clear as anything I've ever heard in my life. Long story short, of course, the nurses wouldn't let him go in. Um, his mom, he finally convinced his mom to go down to the end of the hallway. And uh, 
uh, and they saw the baby. Esteban told me that the door was open where the baby was laying on a bed and he was by himself. It was just the lifeless baby and the nurses would not let him go in. So he stood in the hallway where everybody could hear him and he commanded the baby to come back li to life again. Wow. Now, I don't know what he said and how long he prayed, but when he got it out of his system, he went back to his bedroom, uh, to his room and got back into bed again. And within a half hour, the nurses came back into the room. His mom was there to say, you're never going to believe this, but the baby is alive. Wow. And so we have pictures of Esteban holding that little baby and Esteban and his parents were able to lead those parents to the Lord. They were Catholic. They were able to lead them to the Lord as a result of, of that miracle. So those are just some of the stories of children who were trained to hear God's voice. And when they did, they acted on it and a miracle transpired. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Oh, so good. Yeah. Wow. I've, I've seen things happen too. You know, here in Canada, it just reminds me of a story. This happened probably seven or eight years ago. I was in Quebec and Quebec is, um, it's one of the most unreached places in the Western hemisphere. Wow. Yeah. So like they say it's 0.5% evangelical. Oh my goodness. Yeah. When you go to Montreal, 2% evangelical because there's a lot of immigrants who come from countries, you know, we're Christians. Yeah. And, but so anyway, we, I was ministering in a, in a particular place in Quebec, which there's very, very few Christians, very few churches, especially spirit filled. And the power of the Holy Spirit was moving. Miracles were happening. The presence of God was so strong. And the pastors of the church, their daughter at that time, I believe she was three years old. Um, she was there in the presence of the Lord. And I'm standing at the front and I, I see her. She gets up and she starts walking over towards this man and she kneels down and she touches the man's ankle. And then it's like she's praying in French and then she walks away. So later on, I'm, I was like, well, that was interesting. And later on, I, I um, talked to the pastor. I said, what happened? He said, you never believe it. She said, the Holy Spirit spoke to her and said, I want you to go and pray for that man's ankle. She didn't even know that man. He was a visitor. Mm -hmm. And she went over and she prayed for that man. And he supposedly, the story is, I'm not doubting it. I'm just saying, if I get the, the details correct, if I remember um, you know, exactly what happened is he had metal in his ankle, a pin or something. Oh, wow. Right. And he actually, that, it disappeared after that. Oh, right. yeah. Wow. And it wasn't there later on. So, you know, I, I absolutely believe in this and, and I want to see it happen. And, and I love the concept of the power club. I actually want to learn more about that. We'll talk All right. Yeah. Sounds good. So let's just, in closing, um, we'll, we'll pray, but uh, let's, um, how do people, get a hold of your curriculum, learn more about that. I'm, I've got the website link uh, running here. Is that the best way? Yeah, that's probably the best way. Um, uh, from there, they can find a link to our school. They can also find a link to our store. Um, and then um, they can go and investigate and just look around. Uh, for the nations, we don't ship things internationally because of the shipping costs, but they can download anything, yeah. uh, the online school and all the rest of it. And we have a lot of blogs, a lot of stories yeah. and all the rest. And another place is for them to follow me on Facebook. Okay. Um, uh, my, my personal page, a profile page, I have discovered I get more uh, response on my profile page than I do in I got like 12,000 people on my uh, public pages and hardly anybody ever responds. And, but right. in my little profile page, that's where, so even if I can't take any more friends, they can uh, follow me and everything is set on public. And so I tell a lot of stories there. I talk about the school a lot. Uh, we show pictures, we show videos to keep people inspired and to keep them um, alert to what God is doing around the world. The other thing that, um, we, I have a group for uh, kids ministers, particularly uh, the name of the group is Supernatural Kid Men Children's Ministry. Um, and if they just do a search for that, they'll find it. And um, in there, 
the children's ministers that are in there are mo a lot of them are our leaders or they've used our curriculums or they're uh, like like minded and like spirits and and they all are posting um, um, in, encouraging uh, testimonies of what God is doing. They'll post pictures in there, and so that's the group for your spirit filled Pentecostal charismatic children's ministers. If you want to know more uh, about uh, that avenue, and there's others. We don't think we're the only ones in the world that have a corner on this, but, um, and right. so I, I post advertisements, I'll post specials sometimes for my curriculums, um, and, and all of that. So Facebook, YouTube, just look up Becky Fisher and yeah. look up, and you'll come across my, um, videos very quickly. Uh, the YouTube channel is kids in ministry. Um, you know, sign up for our newsletters. I send out notices. So there's multiple different ways. Uh, that you can get in touch with us. But right. yeah, the website um, will lead you to all of those things that I just mentioned. Oh, and we have a podcast too. I just started a podcast awesome. for people who like that. We take basically strip the audio from the YouTube videos and post them so they can get it on their favorite platform. So yeah, that's great. Yeah, a lot of people listening to the podcast today. Yeah. That's awesome. Good. Okay. Well, listen, everybody, thank you for tuning in. Um, I'll tell you just before we close, I'm going to ask Becky to pray. And yes. uh, however you feel led by the Holy Spirit, Becky, to, to pray for people. Of course, more people are going to listen to the um, on-demand version of this video. Right. And this will also be on all the major podcast platforms as well. So we, we believe that Great. this is going to go viral because this is a powerful, um, powerful things that you've shared today. So yes. Amen. Would you, would you well, Father, we just lift up the body of Christ to you in general, from our children's ministers to our parents to our pastors, Lord, the church as a whole. And God, we just pray that you will bring new revelation and fresh revelation of how important it is to train children while they're still young and not wait until they become teenagers when they're no longer interested in the things of God. God, give us new fresh revelation. Give us a hunger and a determination to begin discipling children while they're boys and girls. God, what an amazing thing it would be to raise a generation of children from preschool years on up who knew how to hear your voice and be led by your spirit. What would the church look like in 20 years? Father, we just plead the blood of Jesus over our churches in this regard. Give our pastors a new a revelation and a new awakening. God, stir the hearts of parents to understand that it's their primary job if they don't do anything else with their kids that they need to raise them in the fear and admonition of the Lord as, as de is described in Deuteronomy chapter six and father that, that given the revelation, they cannot just dump their kids at the church door, inspect their kids to grow up, to be spiritual champions. Father, we just plead the blood of Jesus over this generation Z and generation alpha and those that are still in our homes today, that God, that they will have an awakening in their spirits. Lord, they're, they're, they're ripe for the gospel because they don't have all the baggage to unlearn that older generations do. So father, we just pray that um, even today as they're, they're out in the streets rioting father, that God, that you're going to just stir them and God, just give them dreams, give them visions, give them, yeah. give them an understanding of how real you are God yes, and God. that they will seek you out. They will hunger for the true supernatural and not the, the counterfeit supernatural father. Yeah. We just thank you for it. We give you uh, praise for it in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you. Listen, everybody, thank you for tuning in. And please do check out um, Becky's social media platforms as well as her website for uh, more information, for resources and so on. It's been an honor for us to have you with us, Becky. Thank we you, really, Glenn. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Um, in closing, I'm just going to just comment guys that um, we really believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. We believe in equipping as well. And we have a school of ministry that you may be interested in signing up for. Some of our courses are actually free of charge. Just go to college.awakenations.org and you can sign up there. In addition, um, my website, awakenations.org, there's a lot of teaching resources, including podcast of these interviews, today's interview as well. And then, uh, of course, if you know anyone in Vancouver, uh, we'd love for them to connect with us at Harvest City Church in South Vancouver, harvestcitychurch.com. Thank you again, um, 
Becky, for being with us today. And we really appreciate Thank you joining us. So God bless, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Please share this broadcast. It's on YouTube. It's on Facebook. And uh, it'll be also on uh, podcast platform shortly as well. Bless everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Glenn Blakeney here. And my guest was Becky Fisher of Kids in Ministry. Um, and what a great ministry it has been. God bless you guys. Talk to you later. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Mm -hmm. Bye.